through May, and, and I, I'm not usually the one to say, let's speed things up. But May is always so busy, isn't it? Just always things to do. I mean, we've done a community prayer breakfast. We did baccalaureate. We, I, I don't even know all the stuff that we've done this month already. But God is good, and we still got more to do. Uh, it doesn't just end here. Now, one of the things that I wanted to mention to you is that uh, starting on June 3rd, we'll have two services. And you know what? The, the biggest part of this might be is the fact that the second service, this service right here, will begin at 1030 instead of 1045. That way, you'll get done and out of here. I'll get done and you'll get out of here uh, by 12 o'clock on a normal day. No, I'm just kidding. That's the plan. <laughs> Start at 10.30, be done at 12. The first service will be at 8.15 and will go to 9.30. You do the math, that's only an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we are probably going to experiment with a few things and we might not do some things really well. But I hope that everybody here understands what we're trying to accomplish here. What we're really trying to accomplish is reaching people. I mean, that's just, that's just it. Uh, the 815 service will be more convenient for a lot of people who are doing sports or other activities this summer and give them another opportunity to be in a church service where they would not ordinarily get to. And I've heard this stuff for the last couple of years. Uh, we're going to do it. We're going to try. We're going to see how it goes. Okay? Are y'all with me on that? Yeah. How about the rest of you? No, I'm just kidding. I think, I think everybody is... And, and again, there's a lot of questions that we don't have answers to yet, but we're going to get there. The, the actual Sunday school time will be from 9.30 to 10.30. Now, we want to get people more involved in Sunday school, so what I'm talking to the teachers about, the ones who are teaching in class now, is to have uh, 10, 15 minutes on the beginning and on the end where people can kind of come and go and you can have normal fellowship time, so an actual strong uh, Sunday school lesson will be taught from 9.45 until 10.15. That's when the, the book will be open and, and teaching. Now, if a teacher wants to start sooner than that, great. Or if he wants to go just a little bit after the 10.15, that's great too. But people are welcome to go and get their coffee uh, and, and go get their cinnamon rolls or whatever or, or say hi to somebody else. I don't want to cut into fellowship time anywhere. Uh, so lots to think about. You'll get to hear it again before we actually start it on June 3rd. All right? Everybody good with that? Baptism service is going to be again, like I said, last week on Sunday morning, June the 10th. And, and that'll be in the 1030 service. Um, do you all know how we do baptism here? Raise your hand if you already know. We go to the creek right out back. And, and, and actually, this floor comes up and there's a there's a tank under underneath there and uh, that's, we'll do that during the worship time on Sunday morning. It'll just be a great, a great time. So, does anybody else know what today is? Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, on, right on cue. It's Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday. How many of you know what Pentecost really is? Okay. Okay, that's good. Because you're going to leave here today and you're going to know uh, I, can, I can assure you, I, I want to help you with this. This is going to be my pleasure for sure. This is the last in the series on Risen. And, and the reason that I did Risen this year and the reason that I did Beyond the Resurrection last year is because there was a lot of things that happened because that influences and affects our life forever. And, and, and working its way up to the moment, the day, of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, open them to Acts chapter 1, and it's, uh, you'll see that in Acts chapter 1 is the beginning place of the New Testament church. And there's a lot of conversation these days about whether or not we should return to that first generation church, that first century church. Do y'all want to go back and be like the first century church? Do you want to? Because I'm not sure that I do. I mean, there was a lot of good things that happened in the first century church. Uh, but one of the things that happened a lot was persecution. 
Uh, they were persecuted. They died for their faith, and they knew it. And that's why when people ask that question, they say stuff like, well, how do you know the Bible is true? You can go to, to 12, or 12 apostles. You can go to 500 who seen Jesus. You can go to literally thousands of people who had the testimony of Christ, and they did not recant their faith all the way to death. They were, they were persecuted, yes, but they were also killed for their faith. So in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it says, Jesus presented, presented himself alive to his apostles after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Will you just bow your heads and pray with me for just a moment? Father, we are just asking that your word would come through to our hearts and our minds today. That, that you would, God, allow me somehow to speak clearly concerning the things of your word. That you would let each heart receive clearly the things that come from your spirit today. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. So what he's telling us here is, is Jesus spoke to his disciples and he taught them concerning the issues of the kingdom of God. He wasn't talking about church. Sorry, wait just one second. I can't see it up here. And, and someday we're going to have to pray that prayer in here that God will either give me longer arms or I may, or better eyesight. We may have to set the podium down there for me to be able to see my notes. Jesus was not talking to them about church. He was not talking to them about denomination. He wasn't talking about Sunday school classes or programs in the church. Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God. We've lost that somehow in the 21st century. We, we like doing church and we like doing it our way. What we've forgotten is the reality of the kingdom of God for today. Not the kingdom of the church, not the kingdom of a denomination, not even the kingdom of a religion, but the kingdom of God for today. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now don't get nervous. Don't get nervous on me. I know a lot of you grew up just not even talking about the Holy Spirit much. And I'm, I, 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 we, but we need to. Amen. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Whether you realize it or not, you would never even have come to Christ. You would never have faith in Christ if it were not for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But in John chapter 16, Jesus also said that the, the Holy Spirit is convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's where salvation begins. It wasn't because you and I woke up one day and we were just so smart. And we decided we're going to receive Christ into our life today. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism was for repentance for those who knew that they were falling short of God's expectation. His message was either be fruitful or be fuel for the fire of God. Is that right? You remember when he said every tree that does not bear good fruit is chopped down and cast into the fire. That is still the same option that we have today. We are either going to be fruitful or fuel for the fire of God. John baptized for the knowledge of guilt, for falling short, for repentance, for the wrong things that we have done. But Jesus' baptism is for a change of life that produces fruit. John preached the danger of becoming fuel for God's fire. Jesus preached the power and fruitfulness that comes from the fire of God. What Jesus brought, made available to us, is the work and power of the Holy Spirit that takes us from death unto life. 
And you've seen this as much as I have. People that go to church or have gone to church their whole life. And they seem miserable and wretched and poor. According to Jesus' word in the book of Revelation. And they don't even know why. And the reason why is because God has so much more for us. That comes through the fire of the Holy Spirit. Working in our life and through our life. Now I know. <clears throat> The Holy Ghost and fire sounds unusual and strange to most people. And, and, and the reason I say it that way is because, A, here, uh, something is missing. And people are not sure what to, I, we don't, I, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm not happy. I'm a Christian, but I don't understand direction. I'm a Christian, but I don't, I don't feel complete. Something's missing. In Genesis chapter 22, God told Abraham to take his son Isaac to the mountaintop to become a human sacrifice. And they arrived at the location. Isaac still didn't know that he was going to be the sacrifice. Isaac knew there had to be three things to sac for a sacrifice to take place. There had to be the wood, the fire, and the lamb. And in Genesis 22, 7, it said that Isaac spoke to his father and said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb. Where's the lamb? Remember, uh, Abraham said uh, God will provide himself the lamb. Now, 4,000 years later, we have the wood. Calvary's cross is the wood. We have the lamb. John the Baptist said it. Behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What we don't have, what's missing here for most people is the fire. The fire of God that he wants to light on the inside of us. To accomplish things that we can never accomplish on our own. Where is the fire that separates God's people from this world? Where is the fire that purges and burns away the wickedness of the heart of man? In the heart of man. Isn't it Jeremiah 17, 9 that says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What is it that helps us control the wickedness that the Bible even says we are born with? The thoughts that go through our head that we may or may not be able to control. How do we deal with that? It's with the fire that purges and burns away. Where is the fire that ignites passion for the will and purpose of God? People in our generation have passion for just about anything other than the will of God. People, I've never seen people so passionate about driving. <laughs> Have you seen some of this stuff? If you're feeling convicted right now, it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit, remember? <laughs> people are passionate about sports. I have never seen so much passion about sports. And why is it that the, the Christian church, the, the believers do not have passion for the will and the purpose of God at least equal to their passion for sporting events. When we have the fire, we recognize, number one, the point of no return. We can recognize the point of no return. We have to know when we give our life to Christ, there's no going back. There's no going back. And yet what you find a lot of times, even in the churches, is people are constantly talking about the good old days. The way things used to be. Don't allow yourself to get confused and discouraged because of things that aren't like they used to be. Well, we, it used to be such a great community and, and there was never any crime. or uh, I, I, Look, I, I get that. I, I get that. Every day with Christ and the fire he puts in you can be the beginning of something better. Stop looking back there, because there's no turning back. In Acts chapter 1 verse 6, right before Jesus ascends to heaven, before the eyes of his disciples, he said, therefore, he said, uh, uh, they asked him in, in verse 6 there, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Will, will you restore the, the kingdom to Israel? And after all that Jesus had said and done, their big question was, can you get rid of these Romans? Can you give us back our country? Can you make things the way that it used to be? 
And, and it's like God's people these days who can only talk about what's wrong with the world and, and all of their focus is on the things that we don't like and how much better it once was. There's, there's no fruit in pointing out the past. You get this. The kingdom of God is forward. Amen. The kingdom is forward. The point of no return represents our commitment to, to moving forward, putting our past behind us and leaving out and leaving for the kingdom, living for every day, living for the kingdom of God. Philippians 2.13, Paul even comes out and says, we are to forget those things that are behind and continuously press forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of stuff we just need to let it go. Put it behind us. Move on. Move forward. Be, know this. You can't, you can't undo the things that have gone wrong. There's a lot of stuff that maybe you even did in your past that you cannot undo. I know that's not real encouraging to you this morning to be thinking about that, but I'm just telling you, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to let it rule your life in the present and in the future? The only right thing left to do is put that behind you and keep moving forward. You've come this far. God is going forward. And, and, and you may not understand why some of the things have happened in your past. I mean, honestly, just, just think about it for a second. If you could be totally honest in this moment, how many of you have done things in your past that you wish you could undo? Is there a hand in here anywhere that's not raised? We have all been there. We've all done things that we, we wish we could undo. There's no undoing them. But God doesn't force us to try to undo stuff. He forces us. He's trying to force us to move forward in our relationship with Him because the kingdom of God and, and the glory of God is forward. Focus forward. Number two, God promises power to keep us moving forward. And in all reality, in our own strength, we can't keep moving forward. And we want to give up. We want to quit. We want to settle into what's comfortable here and now. We, or we want to live in the past. We constantly want to point out the things the way that they used to be. The disciples after the resurrection, at the, at the ascension of Jesus, still didn't get it. They still were not on the same page as Jesus. They were asking Jesus about him conquering Rome and restoring the kingdom to Israel. And they're talking about an earthly kingdom, the kingdom of, of Israel. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons which has been put into the Father's hand or into the Father's authority, or into the Father's power. But in Acts 1.8, he said, but you shall receive power. I mean, doesn't that sound just like something God would do when he says, uh, I'm like, you know, you want power. You want power to rule over uh, your boss or your employees, or you want power to rule over your neighborhood, or power to rule over the church. You want all this power, and Jesus comes right out and says, you ain't getting no power. You're not building your own kingdom here. Not giving you the power to, to bully people around or push people around or always get your way. I'm not giving you that power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. God promises power to keep us moving forward. Not the power to make America great again. I'm for it. I am all for it. I really am. I, I don't think you see this stuff on the news, but there has been some good progress made in the last year. There really has. There's been some good things that are done, but that's not the stuff that you get to hear about. All you get to hear about is the negative and the bad and the whatever. I'm not going there. It's not about whether or not we make America great again. It's not even power to undo the bad things that have been done in the past, but with the Holy Spirit comes the power to do the right things for the kingdom of God. I can't guarantee you what this nation will look like in five years. Some of y'all are getting really nervous when I started talking about politics there. I've seen, I seen your look. It's like, it's like the sweat. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what this country will look like in five years or ten years. I don't know what this community will look like a, a year from now. There, there are so many things that we do not know, but I can tell you this. 
God will give us the Holy Spirit and power to move in the direction that he wants us to go so that we can control who we are and what we do for the kingdom of God today. Amen. He gives us that power. He puts that on the inside of us. We might think it would be easier to believe and live for Christ back in those days, in the first century, like the disciples. But that, that's not the way the scriptures describe the events that took place. There were so many who saw the miracles but refused the person of Christ. There were those who heard the word, the same word that you and I read in the Bible today, but they denied the truth of it. I mean, have you ever thought that way? Have you ever just thought, you know, if I could have seen Jesus walking on the water, if I could have seen Jesus multiplying uh, uh, five loaves and two fish and feeding 5,000, I believe I would I'd be there just like the disciples. They literally weren't there. I mean, of all the stuff that they did see, they still weren't there. Some of the most religious leaders of that day, they didn't believe Jesus was giving the word. He was pointing out the prophecies fulfilled, but they determined to kill Jesus. And when you look at the actions of those, even in the inner circle, those closest to Jesus, Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Peter denies him three times. Thomas doubts and says, I will not believe. They all scattered at when the, the, the Romans came and the guards came and the, the chief priests came to arrest Jesus. All, all 11 of them scattered and ran. James and John, some of the best of the disciples of the apostles, wanted to call down fire on innocent people because things didn't go the way they thought they should. They were not getting it. They did not understand. Even after the resurrection in Matthew, it said that when Jesus, uh, when they saw Jesus after the resurrection that they worshiped, but some doubted. Not like Thomas. Not, I'm just not sure. In Mark, Jesus scolded the disciples for their unbelief and the hardness of their heart. I'm not just talking about any of the disciples. I'm talking about the top 11. Yes. They saw these things happen. They seen the whole thing transpire. And yet it says clearly that they had unbelief and hardness of heart. In Luke, it says Jesus appeared and had to ask them the question, why are you terrified and why are you so doubtful? Why are you so full of doubt? In John, uh, Jesus told Thomas, remember, you, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. They're, they're, they were not perfect. They had seen the resurrected Christ and still struggled with the doubt and unbelief. But what is it? that radically made a difference in them and for them and for us and for every person who's lived in any generation since then, the solution to the problems and doubt that the disciples experienced was settled by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It transformed them from fuel for God's fire to fruitfulness by God's fire. You see that? The promise of God and the power of God come together for the good of humanity. In the, in the, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it's where the promise of God and the power of God come together. It was obvious even those who walked with Jesus didn't have the power. To pull it all together and serve God like they should. Jesus knew that they didn't have the power. So he kept talking to them about the possibilities. Uh, Tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. He kept talking to them about the Holy Spirit. If, if, uh, he said, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, then he, the comforter, the Holy Spirit will come. And he will show you things to come. He will lead you in all truth. Jesus kept throwing the possibilities out of them. When he said you shall receive power, he was talking about an event that would radically change all of those who would believe. What you cannot do in your own strength or power, Jesus said you shall receive power. You don't have to raise your hands or anything, but is there anybody in here that could use just a little bit more power to deal with the things of this world and the darts of the wicked one that are being thrown at us completely? 
totally, without fail, without stop, continuously. Amen. I mean, they're, they're, this is where we are. And, and, and a lot of people just say, well, I don't know why God's not doing anything. And at the same time, I think God is saying, I don't know why they're not doing anything. That's right. What are we waiting on? If he's laid it all out here, why do we keep playing around in the fire? Are we, are we setting ourselves up to become fuel for the fire? Or are we following God's word that we may become fruitful by the fire of God? Number three. Pentecost is the day of decision, a turning point of kingdom power. The Old Testament reveals many miracles and secrets about God's power, uh, but mostly it comes through the prophets. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says that God, who in very, at various times and in different ways, spoke in times past unto our fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Pentecost is about the Holy Spirit and the church. It comes through Jesus. It's because of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus now speaking through, through the Holy Spirit into our life, into our heart. What is Pentecost? Pentecost really, I, I know people get afraid of it. I mean, there's people that have gone to church for decades and, and don't even like the word Pentecost. Never said the word Pentecost, except we don't like it. I know that, but Pentecost is a very simple word. It simply means 50 or the 50th. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> it was the feast day. Uh, it was called the Feast of Weeks, Shabbat in Hebrew. It simply means 50 days or the 50th day after what? Anybody know? Passover. The 50th day after Passover. In Exodus 32, Moses is on Mount Sinai and he receives the tablets of stone, remember, with the Ten Commandments carved with the very finger of God. But it says that the people who were down in the valley rose up to play. And Aaron tells them, listen, these are the words of Aaron in, in verse 5 of Exodus 32. He said, tomorrow is a feast day. A feast day. And everybody agrees that that is the feast of weeks, the Old Testament Pentecost, 50 days after Passover in Egypt. You remember how this Passover in Egypt went, right? Where, where uh, God said on the, the final plague, the death of the firstborn is going to happen unless you have blood over the doorpost. And you were to kill a lamb, and you were to eat the meat, and you were to take the blood and put it over the doorpost of your home, and the death angel would pass over your house. That's the first Passover. This Pentecost out in the wilderness when Moses is on Sinai, is the first day of Pentecost. But it just fell in line with the Feast of Weeks. They, those people made a golden calf. Moses comes down and he wants to kill them. God wants to kill them all. Moses intercedes and says, uh, who is on the Lord's side? Now, I don't know if you were to get into a big public area these days and ask the question, who is on the Lord's side? I don't know how many people would say, not me. When you draw a line in the sand, you go to, uh, I don't know, somewhere like Royal Stadium or, well, not these days because there's not more than a couple hundred people there, I think, these days. <laughs> go to a Chiefs game. Go to a Chiefs game and everybody that's on the Lord's side is on this side of the 50-yard line and everybody who's not is on that side. Now, they died. Those who were not on the Lord's side died that day. Do you remember how many there were? Anybody just shout it out. Crickets, I hear it. 3,000 died that day because they chose not to be on the Lord's side. Now listen, 50 days after Passover, the Passover of Jesus' sacrifice, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, when, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were seated. Peter goes out, preaches his first message after that. You remember how many people got saved? Shout it out if you know it. 3,000. 3, the day of Pentecost. Old Testament Pentecost, 3,000 lost their life. New Testament Pentecost, 3,000 people gave their life to Christ and were saved. Pentecost is avoided by some people because of what it represents. Some people don't like the idea of miracles and manifestations of God's power. I'm not sure why. 
I'm not sure why any of us would think that somehow or another God has done. And that God has drawn a line in the sand somewhere, somewhere in the past and said, no more. Am I going to do anything miraculous or anything big or anything life-changing? That's all up to you now. I'm not sure how we ever got that idea or how that idea ever slipped into the church. But I can tell you this for sure. Whenever you get to the point where you say God doesn't do miracles anymore, God cannot do miracles, I'm going to question that you know whether or not God is for real. What kind of relationship would this be if we didn't identify God for who he really is? What kind of a relationship would it be if you did not identify and know your spouse for who they really are? God is who he always has been. When, when Moses asked the question at the burning bush, who shall I tell him is sending me, he said, tell him I am that I am. Not I will be, not that I was, but I am. There's no other way to identify God except the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. You can't take the power away from God and still expect Him to do anything great in your life. That's right. And we've done that. We've shelved the power of God and we've shelved the miraculous thinking that we're hurting somebody's feelings if we ask God for a miracle. Listen, I'm, I need a miracle. Tongue and oxy needs a miracle. Amen. you got to have somewhere in your family that you need a miracle. Let's just quit pretending here and recognize our relationship with, with God for what it really is. If you believe Him and who He says He is, there is no limit to what He can do. you believe it? Amen. All right. Some people believe that Pentecost is the dangling character. That is never attainable. Oh, they're talking about all miracles and manifestations, and, and I've never seen it. I've, I've heard it. It's just weird to me. That, the, the dangling carrot that's not attainable. Go back and read. Go back and read uh, the book of Acts. Some people believe that Pentecost is a, a once for all event, never be repeated. And I'm not just saying, throwing this at you. There's people that stand in the pulpit every Sunday morning and say, and, and they'll tell you what happened at Pentecost is over. That was a one-time shot. It was a one-time deal, like the, the rocket blast of the New Testament church. And when it hit certain altitude, the thrusters fell off, and that's all that miracle stuff is no more. How many of you could stand up today and argue that fact just because of what God has done in your life? You know that God has performed miracles. You've seen God do things that you cannot explain. And why do we feel like we have to be able to explain it, I don't know. At what point in our life do we feel like we can understand the deep things of God? God gets to do whatever God jolly well pleases. And I'm inviting him to do it here today and in this community. Pentecost represents the birth of the New Testament church and the church age, and that is true. But listen, life is not supposed to end at birth. That is not natural. If Pentecost was the birth of the New Testament church, why do we think it ended there? Life is not supposed to end at birth. Pentecost is about the church but more than that, Pentecost is about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is a lot of things, but the most important way to describe the Holy Spirit is about power. That's what Jesus said. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come on you. But there's another adjective, uh, freedom. He sets us free. Truth. He'll lead you into all truth. Peace and joy. There's a lot of adjectives that, that, that describe the Holy Spirit. But the best one, I believe, is B. And that is the Holy Spirit is here. He's here. And He's here for us. Right. You, you, you hear people singing sometimes and, and they're, they're worshiping God and it gives you goosebumps. Y'all ever get Holy Ghost goosebumps? That's the way we kind of play with it. And I, I, got, the, I got tingled, you know, a, lip, a, a quiver in my liver because of the song or the preaching or something. And it was, you know, this is what the Holy Spirit does. He connects with you. 
How? I've, this is a question. I've prayed about it a lot. I've sought God over it. I fasted for 40 days and 40 nights asking the question. Is it Laurel or Yanny? <laughs> and some of you look at me like, what is he talking about? I didn't know it was weird. I just thought it was all make-believe and weird and goofy and dumb stuff. People playing tricks on those suckers that are on Facebook. Until I, I let Lisa listen to it on my phone. And she said, they're saying, Laurel. I said, no, they're not. They're saying, Yanny. No, it's Laurel. And she finally just got tired of it. I asked her, I said, who, who are you here now? And she's like, I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> All of you who hear Laurel, raise your hand. Any Yannies in the house? I'm going to give you a third category. I don't care. I mean, it don't matter. But you know what that does prove? It proves in the physical what God is trying to prove in the spiritual, and that is the fact that it doesn't matter what's being said out here. The Holy Spirit can say something else in here. Amen. And he's wanting to communicate to each one of us individually. And he's wanting to communicate with us specifically. We need, we need to learn this. I, I've told you before, I've had people catch me right outside the door and say, oh, when you said this, it's like life-changing to me. And I'm like, well, praise God. <laughs> Truth is, I didn't say what they said I said. <laughs> that wasn't me. I didn't, I didn't say that. I kind of know the stuff that I say. <laughs> but what they heard That's right. was from the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. You can go, and I used to love to go, and I'd listen to any preacher. I still will. It don't matter to me. I'll listen to anybody preach. And you can still hear the Holy Spirit, even if it's one of those preachers you've got no business listening to. <laughs> they, they, you're not sure if they're using the Bible, the Koran, or the Boy Scout handbook. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you can listen to somebody like that, and I believe the Holy Spirit can still speak to you. I really do. I believe the Holy Spirit can speak to you when you're talking to somebody up there, brothers, market about how fresh the meat is. I really do. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to communicate, speak to us all the time. Amen. That's right. If you're willing to listen. The Holy Spirit is here. John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray to the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may, uh, that he may abide with you forever. How long is forever? It's forever. The Greek word there is paraclete, and it means the one who walks beside. And if he is the promise and he's been given, then he's walking beside us, you, forever. The Bible says, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would bring power in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we already read. Jesus said he would bring freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Jesus said the Spirit will lead you into all truth in John 16. The Word tells us that the Spirit brings peace and joy. Romans 14, 17, I think. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Don't be afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to talk about the Holy Ghost. If there's anything missing in the life of believers that causes fear and stress and doubt, it is the work and power and comfort of the Holy Spirit. He alone brings peace in our storms. So then, if God has poured out the Holy Spirit at Pentecost for the church, if He has given the Holy Spirit, then what is left for us? What is our part in receiving the Holy Spirit with the magnitude and impact of a biblical proportion? Now, I've been through a lot of, of church services. Where we, we, we heard him say, we're going to tarry here until you be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not going to leave until you speak with tongues. We're, not, we're, not, we're going to keep doing this over and over again. We're, I've been through all those services. I want, you to just, I want you to just do this and ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Just take a deep breath. Did anybody else do that? Relax. I'm not, I'm, I don't know what the Holy Spirit looks like in you. I'm not expecting anything. But what I will point out, and it comes from Acts chapter 1, verse 14, where it said that these, all them that were in the upper room, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. 
there's, there's three things in there actually, and, and I'm only going to point out two that we really need to look at, concentrate on, and focus on if we want the reality and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our life. Do y'all want them, yes or no? Yes. Yes? <clears throat> One of them is unity, and I'm not going to talk about it that much. We're going to do that here in a couple of weeks. Unity is important. They were all in one place, in one accord. That, they're not talking about a Honda Accord either. They're talking about <laughs> unity, right? It's unity that they're dealing with. That's what, not the one we're going to talk about. Number one, though, is the fire is missing because we are not asking. The first one he said is pray. When he talks about praying, he's talking about asking. He's talking about communicating with God, yes. But asking is important to everything that God has promised us. In James 4, 2, it says we have not because we ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask and miss. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Um, could, could it be the problem we struggle with? We should, the most in life, the problem we struggle with most in life, we somehow or another um, would rather learn to live with it than to ask God to get us through it? Could it be that our the real help that we need in life, the thing that's missing, the thing that's hurting us most, that we've um, just learned to live with it? Maybe we've learned to live without something because we not ask. We don't ask. I'm not real sure. I'm not real sure why we leave God out of the asking. There are people that go to the thrift store all the time and ask for help, ask for money, ask for relief, ask for clothes, ask for food. People, people are always asking other people. Maybe we don't have from God the things that we need because we don't ask. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus said, if you then be an evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? In Matthew 7, 11, he said the exact same thing. If you then be an evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will God give you? Here's the difference. Good things if you ask. He's waiting for us to ask. Holding back is not a good idea. Holding back asking is not God's intention for your life. It's not God's best for you. Holding back, looking back, turning back is our decision, not God's. I know people that go just a certain amount with God. They, they'll go a certain distance with God and, it's, and that's it. No more, no further. I mean, I'm okay with God changing my Sundays. But that's it. I'm not going any further. I'm not... I'm not going to let God change my the way I am at work. Remember Lot's wife? She kind of got used to some stuff that she really shouldn't have got used to. And then when she did get to see God, the angels that took them out, uh, she just couldn't help herself, could she? That's right. She had to look back. It ended her progress with God when she looked back. Don't end your process with God by spending your time looking back. Back Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're doing, if you're doing the deal, you don't have time to spend looking back there. I, I know I've, you've heard this before, but rearview mirrors, this big. Windshields, this big. Reason why? Glimpse every now and then. This is your focus out here. Hebrews 10, 38 says, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, God said, my soul, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Luke 12, 32, Jesus said, don't live in fear, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Ask, you shall receive. See, you shall find. Knock, it shall be open to you. Why would any of us put off asking? Let me, can I ask you this question with all the love in my heart? Can, is it okay if I go a couple minutes after 12 this week and, instead of two weeks from now? Is it okay? okay? We're going to close. We're going to close pretty quick. Why would any of us put off asking, do, are things not bad enough yet? Are, are, are things in, in our generation, are they not bad enough yet? For us as believers to start asking God specifically in Acts chapter 2 verse 19. God gave this prophecy back in Joel chapter 2 also and then it came to reality here. God said, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. 
The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do things have to get worse before we get serious about the fullness of God in our life? Because it's going to get worse. Isn't that pretty much what the Bible talks about, prophesies more than anything else? Is that it gets more difficult. We're not supposed to have utopia here. I believe sometimes in this world God turns up the heat so that people will miss Him and turn to Him in faith. But the heat's going to get hotter. The problems are going to get big. Ask in faith. Ask with expectation. Ask knowing that God does care and wants to give what you need. In Hebrews 11, 6, it says uh, those that come to God must believe that He is. But they also have to believe that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So the first thing they said there was pray, ask. All right, the next one. The, the, uh, number two, the fire of the Holy Spirit is revealed in supplication. Now, supplication is not just sitting back and being zapped with God's Spirit on the day of Pentecost. When the Spirit was poured out, the disciples were in their upper room. They had been told to tarry until they were endued with power from on high. Now, uh, if Pentecost means 50 days, how, how long did Jesus work with his disciples? Anybody remember the number? 40. Thank you. Nobody said that. I don't think. I just act like I can hear all of y'all because I can't most of the time. So 40 days Jesus was, was with his disciples. <clears throat> So there were 10 days between the ascension and the day of Pentecost. 10 days in the upper room. They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Sometimes God says, go and do. But sometimes God says, be still and know that I am God. Don't be guilty of waiting for God to move when God is wanting you to move. They waited on God to do something, but in the process of them waiting on God to do something, they were waiting on God. They were serving God, doing what they knew to do, doing what they knew was right. So the other component of, at Pentecost is supplication. If you've ever heard me talk about supplication before, I'll remind you of what my history teacher used to say when I was a junior in high school. She would say, repetition is good for the mind. And she'd look straight at me and she'd say, it works best if you're awake. <laughs> just, just so you know, I, you, I, you may have heard this before. Most of the time when people talk about supplication, they're making it to mean prayer. That's what we've heard. Or sincere prayer. Or deep prayer. Or whatever. The problem with that is, is that in six of the seven times that this word is used in the New Testament, it is used alongside the word prayer. Such as in this verse in Acts 1 where it says they continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. There are six Old Testament words that are translated supplication. Six in the Old Testament. But there are only two New Testament Greek words translated supplication. The one in Acts 1, along with five other times in the New Testament, the word supplication in the Greek is the word thesis. How many of y'all heard me talk about this before? Okay. So, <laughs> Desis, okay, D-E-E-S-I-S, Desis. And it is about, I'm telling you, this, this can change your whole relationship with God and your whole way of living. You'll listen. The only English word that comes close to the, the Greek word Desis is the word depreciation. You can look it up in dictionaries, however you want, Hebrew or, or Greek dictionary, uh, look in the Young's Analytical Concordance, the only word they can find that really can be translated well in the English language is the word depreciation. You know what depreciation is. If you don't, go buy yourself a brand new truck, take it home, and then take it back up there and tell them you want to sell it back to them. Depreciation is the difference between the value that you paid for it and the value they are now offering to you. And most of the time it's what, 10, 20%. You lose when you drive a new car off of the lot. The word supplication, when used alongside the word prayer, carries the implication of depression because, I'm oh, sorry, depreciation, be, becoming less, of, of less value, less in terms of importance, 
less in terms of, of rights. You know, the, the better you become as a Christian, the more you'll realize the less rights you have. You give up your rights for the sake of others. John the Baptist said it like this when he discovered that Jesus was the Christ. He said in John chapter 3, verse 30, He must increase, I must decrease. That's depreciation, that's desis, that's supplication. In the upper room, they were not only praying, but they were surrendering parts of themselves totally, absolutely, completely. It, it's not, um, supplication is, is not about you talking to God, but me decreasing my self-worth, my self-decreasing, and God increasing in me. Supplication is about what you lose, what you give up, what you, what you surrender that, that he becomes more, more in your life, greater in value than yourself. Paul expressed, expressed it in a different way. In Romans 12, 1, y'all remember this one. I, he's, when Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's Jesus. Surrendering what I have to who he is. In Galatians 2, 20, Paul said, like that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It's no longer my life. It's no longer about me. That's Jesus. That's supplication. That's surrendering what we have for something bigger, something better, something more. They were in the upper room. They were praying, but they were there because they surrendered a part of their life. Supplication is all about what you give up to become everything God wants you to be. You want the Holy Spirit working in your life? Recognize the fact that you need to surrender to God. That's what happened in the upper room. Matthew 16, 25, Jesus said, Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. I'm going to ask the worship team, if you would, to come on up. And they're going to sing as we as we go out here today. <clears throat> what do you need to lay on the altar of God's Pentecost? There's, a, there's a, 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 an issue of exchange that I need you to see in the New Testament. And then we're done. Exchanging one thing for something better. Exchanging jobs for Jesus. Wrong relationships for righteousness. Religion for revival. Stress for peace. Fear for faith. Your failure for his future. Your past for his promises. It's like Isaiah 61 3, where it said, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. But it doesn't end there. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said he came to, to, to preach and give the gospel for poverty, healing for the brokenhearted, deliverance for the captive, sight to the blind, freedom for those who are oppressed. It's no different in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter Five, the poor in spirit, he gives the kingdom of heaven. Those that mourn, he gives comfort. And on and on it goes. You get the idea. God is wanting total access to your life by the Holy Spirit so that he can help you exchange what you have for what you really need. To give up what you have to receive what you really need so he can supplement your deficiencies with those things. That only he can give. The storms of life get rough. When it looks like there is no hope. When it feels like everything is going wrong and everything is going against you. The Holy Spirit is the one who's here to bring peace and comfort and boldness to get you through. Not just to get you through, but to get you through victoriously. Amen. Let's all stand together, if you would, with every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment. See, you're going to see something that, that we're about to do. 
no, no, no miracle in the moment. Just the truth of God's word that has control of me and you if we let it. Your head bowed and your eyes closed. You want to receive the Holy Spirit? It's more about you. See, see, that whole discussion really ended whenever you gave your life to Christ, when you received Christ. The real discussion now is not whether or not you have God, but does God have you? Does he have all of you? Because he'll move, he'll work, he'll do things in your life if you surrender all to him. You're in this room right now and you've never just you've never given your life to Christ. You've never invited Jesus into your heart. You've never surrendered to God of the universe. And you'd like to today. I just want you to slip up your hand real quick. I just want to see you and, and we'll pray for you from up here. God bless you. Anybody else? Come on. I, I just need, I need to give my life to Christ. I need to surrender everything I have. I like what you're talking about. God bless you. Man. Bless you. Else. Come on. I'm not going to take a lot of time. It's the most important thing you could ever do. But you'll have to do it on your own. I can't make that decision. Anybody else? Come on. I just I want God in my life. I want him real. Thank you. Man. I need all the good. It's all right. Thank you. you know what? If that was you, you raised your hand, or maybe, maybe you're feeling that way. You just didn't raise your hand. I want you to just just do this. Just say something to the effect. God in heaven, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior and I understand Jesus is your son and he died for my sins. I'm inviting you into my heart. Take over my life. Show me the right way to go from this moment forward. With the heart Man believes unto righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Receive the salvation of God today and it comes freely in Jesus' name. Now there may be some more in here who are saying, I just don't know that I've ever surrendered to the Holy Spirit. You said that prayer just now. That's what you need. The Holy Spirit will take it from here. You have some things need to put on the altar of God's sanctifying fire. Make this the moment. Make it now. Surrender to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He wants to do some new things in your life and in your heart. I'm going to close the prayer. Our elders are moving their way toward the front. If you gave your life to Christ today, you just walk by and tell them, I gave my life to Christ today. You're, you're asking for the Holy Spirit to take charge. I want you to just walk by and say, hey, I, I need the Holy Spirit to take me through the storm that I'm going through right now. I need, I need to give my life to the Holy Spirit. Let, just make sure you do that on your way out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, for your word, for, the, for your truth, what it means to us as we receive it. God, your word says that the Holy Spirit will reveal truth to us. He'll, he'll guide us into all truth. He will show us things to come. He will convict us. But he'll also bring comfort and joy and peace in our life. And so, God, I'm asking for every person in this room who's willing to surrender their life today that you would make the Holy Spirit known. God, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Show us the way when it looks like there is no way. Bring healing. God, where healing is needed, bring hope where there doesn't seem to be any. Show yourself strong in the lives of your people, this people. We ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you guys. Give the Lord a hand before you.